And, and a warm welcome to our event on new opportunities for manufacturing and prototyping in the clean tech sector. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Martin Garrett and I'm Chief Executive of Cambridge Clean Tech. I'm joined this morning in giving you a welcome by David Broach, who's one of the directors at uh, Alia. I'll hand over to David uh, in a second. I'm just going to take you through a couple of things. First of all, some uh, pointers on housekeeping uh, for the event uh, this morning. And then I just wanted to mention a couple of the areas of focus that we've been undertaking in terms of our support for the clean tech sector in these uh, somewhat unusual times that we're all uh, very much familiar with. So just to begin with some points on housekeeping, please do remain muted if you could, uh, just to help with the uh, transmission. If you do have a question, we'd be pleased to hear from you, but please can you type it in the chat box in the center of your console, uh, in the strip in the middle of your box at the base of the uh, screen. I will either raise it with the um, individual speaker as we go through, if it's a pressing question, or if not, I'll store it and uh, raise the question um, at the end. Uh, in the Q&A uh, before we go into our uh, breakout or coffee rooms. And we do have four of those coffee rooms, so please do let us which one of those you, uh, you may wish to uh, go into. Uh, please do also note that we are recording uh, the session this morning, just uh, for your information, and we'll put it on our website uh, later on today after, after the event. And also um, on the event this morning with us, we have Orian, who's been letting you all into the room, uh, and also Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia who will uh, keep us in uh, good order uh, between them, um, I hope. So that's it on the, uh, on the housekeeping for the event. Uh, just in terms of Cambridge Clean Tech and what we've been doing to support our businesses and our network in these difficult times, focusing really on the priorities of members. So first of all, access to finance is very important for them. And that's topical. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about that later on today from uh, CATEX. Uh, but we've organized a Clean Tech Venture Week at the end of November. Uh, we've had 115 applications to pitch from innovators. Uh, those applications have been whittled down to the 28 most investment ready companies who pitch to an e room full of clean tech uh, investors um, over the course of the uh, over the course of the week. There'll also be keynote presentations and there'll be breakout space and booths. So you have plenty of chance, even if you're not pitching to, to meet with the investors during the course of the uh, two or three days. So do take a look at that uh, on our website. Uh, the other big uh, item for our members is related to contract opportunities. And just last week, we had an international week where we had two events looking at the needs of corporates from both uh, Poland and also from China. Um, and those are still open. So if you have solutions for those corporates, take a look at their needs on our website and do apply uh, to those uh, corporates and who knows you could end up with uh, some sort of JV or a pilot contract uh, with those for your products uh, to help satisfy their innovation needs. And just earlier this week we've just entered two more requirements from two municipalities in uh, Europe, one from Delft in the Netherlands and another one from Espo in Finland. And both of those local authority areas are looking for um, clean tech solutions for sustainable energy in terms of district uh, heating and batteries and storage and so on. So if you think you have solutions for them, again, by all means, take a look at our website and uh, do uh, provide them with solutions. And again, there's opportunities for contracts there with those uh, local authority areas in Europe. So those are just a couple of examples of what we've been doing. And of course, we have a full events programme. You can check that out on the events page of the Cambridge Clean Tech website. And today's event is obviously a further example of that. So delighted to be working with our partners at Alia uh, to help launch uh, the Innovation Lab at the Peterborough facility. And I think without further ado, I'll hand over to David, David Broach, who's one of the uh, directors at Alia for the Future Business Centre. And he is himself based at Peterborough. And of course, we see him quite regularly uh, in Cambridge as well. So David, over to you to welcome the attendees further and to say a few words about the uh, facilities at Peterborough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. And, and thanks to the, uh, the team at Cambridge Clean Tech for, uh, for organising this event today. Um, so just a, a very brief um, introduction from me in terms of the, uh, the Innovation Lab before I hand over to, to uh, my colleagues, James and Chris. Um, the Innovation Lab is uh, a, 
located in our um, Future Business Centre at London Road in, in Peterborough. Um, it's been uh, opened in, in partnership with, uh, with Anglian Water. And essentially we see it as the, the go-to place for, uh, for open innovation, product development and prototyping for innovators, entrepreneurs, small businesses that are looking to address social or environmental challenges um, but haven't got necessarily access to um, sort of the high level equipment um, or have capacity within their, their own businesses um, to really drive that forward. So the lab essentially brings a, a facility with um, a sort of high level equipment that covers all aspects of that, that product development journey. So all the way from um, the initial concept and design all the way through um, to um, essentially developing a, a finished or a working uh, prototype. Um, the lab itself is, is broken into five areas um, that cover uh, CAD and, and digital design um, with uh, sort of a, a wide range of uh, CAD and uh, sort of uh, other design software. Um, we have uh, a big area for electronics and systems, so building with PCBs and uh, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, that type of thing. A, uh, a hard making area with various sort of hand tools, um, a, a large scale laser cutter um, and various other tools and, and, uh, and bench, uh, bench side equipment. Um, and a suite of 3D printers um, ranging from your sort of a, a small desk based um, printers that sort of a, that might be a, a sort of a hobbyist level right up to um, sort of almost well certainly sort of much larger liquid resin printers um, at the higher end of the uh, of, of the spectrum of, of 3D printers. Um, so uh, and, and yeah and as well as that we offer sort of equipment hire um, a 3D bureau service um, as well as bespoke product development to actually support say innovators that are, are looking to develop their um, their product or, or solution. Um, we've got a fantastic team we've got uh, James Ownsworth who is our, our lab technician um, who is a very very uh, experienced in terms of engineer his engineering background um, and Chris Bartram who is our business development manager who uh, will be able to sort of go into the, sort of the details of the opportunities of collaboration and so on and so forth that we can find through through the lab. Um, that is, is, is pretty much it uh, in terms of uh, my introduction, um, but I'll hand over to, to, to James and, and Chris to tell you a little bit more detail um, about the facility. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, David, for that um, introduction, that overview. And without further ado, as you say, let's hand over to James and to Chris, who are the specialists uh, at the uh, lab in Peterborough. I think you're going to also do a sort of a virtual tour for us as well, but over to you two gents, thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, I'm Chris Bartram, I'm the Business Development Manager here at the Innovation Lab. And I'm saying James Ironsworth, I'm the Innovation Lab Technician here. Um, just for clarity, the third person joining us on the screen is Andy, one of our much valued members. He's struggling with the sound in the lab, so I've asked him to join us. Hope that's okay. Um, the plan was today, Martin, as you say, absolutely. We, we have already shot a virtual with a bit of an explanation where we are, our business model, a slight sense of redefining. So what we were going to do, if, if that's okay, is jump straight into the, the video tour itself. And uh, we'll be at the back end of that to pick up any questions, hopefully. Thank you very much. So the idea is um, we're going to give you a short virtual tour of the lab, um, probably about 10 minutes in total. But I just thought prior to that, it's probably why setting the scene in terms of the business model and, and where we are now, given the last six months, um, it's probably fair to say there's, we find in resistance for people to physically come into the lab, which was the original idea and um, understandably so. 
So while we have a number of members at the moment, we're probably not going to populate to the level we intended by the end of the year. So the idea is now that we slightly refine the model itself and this has come about over the last few weeks we've had a number of people that are now coming in with ideas that have no familiarization with the equipment and certainly not the skill set and what they're asking is can we develop that idea so in other words more product development that they're looking at and they would pay a fee as opposed to a membership fee etc so we're exploring those ideas and seeing where we can go with that I mean to me there's we have state-of-the-art equipment and we have excellent resource in James etc so it's something that I think we need to explore um, as a plan B just we're not moving away from the original model just refining it slightly um, and I think in terms of product development James you've yeah. got some ideas um, Obviously, I've got a background in that, so I've got the experience to help others with product development and prototyping. Um, numerous people I've been in contact with, as Chris has just mentioned, they're open to the idea of product development, but not so much as using the space and unaware of the expertise that goes with that. Um, I think if it's something that we can offer and help people develop what they want to produce, it it not only helps us here in the lab, but also helps actually bring that idea into reality and in a time frame that's not going to span um, multiple years. So you're not going out and seeking your own skills yourself. You can go ones that are accessible through myself and Chris. So it's something that can progress forward in a positive manner and that's not uh, stalling really um, and taking so long to do it that it becomes unfeasible. So I think it's I think it's a positive way of going forward that people can utilize that and actually make the most out of the lab so and again just reinforcing that we, we're not looking to completely change the model in terms of getting members in using the equipment under james's watchful eye it's more a case of potentially there is a business opportunity there that we are keen to explore and i think further and above that is um maybe even as an interim that we have some kind of concept evaluation days whereby clients are approaching us i mean all too well we know there's a plethora of ideas out there that are never getting beyond step one but i think conversely we have numerous ideas where people um just seem determined to see it through and they're hemorrhaging money and time wasted on it etc so by way of these evaluation days we can sit them down look at potential prototypes do a small amount of market analysis, getting them through to the commercialization stage and um, you know, potentially see where we go with that. So we, we do have a few business ideas and I think under the current climate, we'd be foolish not to. So uh, we'll keep you all posted, updated on that. And now if we may, we'd like to do the tour. Um, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll start off with the uh, the cabin digital media section and then we'll work his way around if everyone's okay are we all here in the scene okay just give us a nod if you think yeah brilliant so we've got two brilliant individuals in with us today we've got andy and jamie Give us a wave. Yeah, right. So to begin with, we have got the Canon Digital Media. So um, we're running SolidWorks and we've got various different things on there. We can produce models, simulations, as well as Adobe software. So we can do it such as media and things like that at the same time. We have A4 and A1 printers. So best to utilize those really. So we're not really limiting ourselves of what we can do here in the lab. It can well, we can produce anything really imaginable in that regard. So posters, if people want that for advertising for their products. Um, plans, we can do that, or CAD drawings, so it's easier to see them and understand, so you're not having to uh, download the software such as the same. You can do that through us, and we can uh, send those through to you as well. So moving on from that section there, we have our uh, electronics and systems. So... Um, been able to do all sorts of different bits here, such as uh, PCBs, 
Arduinos, so full control systems of, of the lab, uh, robotics, sections such as that really. We don't really want to limit ourselves and we can do all sorts of different parts that we wish to really. So we've got uh, Jamie here who's uh, been with us just recently now. Um, if you'd be able to give us some insight. So I'm looking to innovate a technique to repair maintenance and leak detection within the water industry. I've um, got a company doing repair and maintenance and I've been doing it for 12 years myself. I just think there needs to be a big change in the way we do it. What I'm looking to do will reduce carbon footprint by 75%, excavation by 75%, um, water will be staying on by a chance of 99% unless the leak's on a ferrule where the one customer would have to go off water. But apart from that, everyone else will stay on. You'll have no problems with your three hour shut windows or anything going forward. Uh, that's sort of where I'm trying to go. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, as you can see, we're just trying to well, populate the space at the moment. We say we've got uh, Jamie in, he's doing some brilliant work at the moment, um, helping him best we can and help him through the, each stage of the development. So, both Chris and myself are able to assist within that. So, we can help him get to where he wants to be with his final end product, really. So, as you can see at the moment, we have various different setups that we can have at the moment. Um, we can make models here, simulate them, test them. So it's the full range really from start to finish of the production. So moving around, we have our making area, um, fully equipped area at the moment. We have a set of um, bench devices going across the full range, heat press for fabric. So we're not just limiting ourselves to um, the mechanical side of it. So we've got a broad range of everything. Hand tools with the full selection here, as well as large machines such as the CNC cutter in the corner, uh, vacuum former, and the laser cutting machine. So anything that you want to design or have us design on your behalf, we can have that up and running and made within even a day if we have the time, or if you want to come in and use that as well. So really utilizing the space. If we can fill the space as well, even better. So we'll nip around now and go into the 3D printing section area. Um, full selection on here from uh, liquid machines, so liquid resin. We can produce high quality definition parts, more simplistic um, but ready available 3D printed parts through using filament. So at the moment we're just having some brackets made to make some protective screens within the Alia. So that helps with our COVID policy. Um, so we can be running them off daily. So things like that, people can come in use the devices themselves and uh, yeah, really utilize the space. Again, we have some parts that have just been 3D printed on our Polyjet printer. So if you're wanting more of a final prototype, we've got more high-end, high-range printers here as well. So if you're going on to that final stage of production, we can do that so it's ready to present to people as like a very high quality finish that can also not just look good, also perform well as well in a practical manner. Um, so I'll take you back through now into our making area. And um, we've got Andy in as well here today as well. Um, another one of our brilliant members. Um, he's been working here now about, about a month or so just over with us. That's right. um, I've been working quite, um, quite closely alongside of him. And uh, well, I'll let him speak for himself really. He's been working extraordinarily wonderfully well. I've never had such um, support and, and incredible help to get my, um, my NHS project uh, further down the road and we're, we're practically there. Um, the, uh, the innovation and the, um, uh, the, the professionalism that this place brings to the work that I often do at home um, with very limited facilities is overwhelming. It's a fantastic, fantastic result. And, uh, and from James has been brilliant. I, I can't praise these guys enough. Just to give you an idea, over here, I've um, just finished getting a concept ready to enable older people to um, be able to give themselves a warm water be day wash if they struggle with their personal hygiene. And the Academic Health Science Network, working on behalf of the NHS, to bring in the innovation to the NHS are supporting me with this. And the way I've been able to progress this 
using the help of the innovation lab has been extraordinary. When you've got everything together all in one place and you can move things around from one thing to another, let me give you an example. I've got one that I've just been testing over here in the sink. And to be able to make these things happen in such a way that this item here, which we've just perfected and James has just finished making these particular um, uh, extraordinarily shaped and, um, uh, and located uh, one tunnels for this device, means that I can test this now in this facility just by using this tiny little test ring. If I pop the wand through the seat like that to make it um, be able to be demonstrated. If I don't put my hand there, I'll get a face full of water. But if I turn that on, you'll get the idea and you can see how that is washing. And an elderly person being able to do that with warm water to clean themselves after using the toilet when they've struggled with it for quite some time, it's quite a big deal, especially so they get a sense of reassurance that they're clean and they are dealing with their own personal hygiene instead of having to ask their spouse or a loved one to do it. It's a big deal. Um, having this facility is just amazing to carry you forward. Thanks, Tim. Brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I've got Paul here as well. He's been helping Andy okay. with... Uh, with the work that we've been, well, he designed the brackets that came in uh, yesterday. So, um, been printing them on the uh, 3D printers here. Uh, James has been helping me out and we've been getting some parts printed off so that we can do these tests and, and uh, can do some trials and proof runs of, of the idea of how it all works. Yeah. So, so we printed some parts this morning um, and uh, James is going to help me uh, take them off, off of here so that you guys can have a look at the. Uh, um, the parts were super intricate, intricate little tiny uh, nozzle components that uh, help direct that one that Andy just showed you uh, in the right direction um, and uh, it's on to, to help the, the whole thing work together. Um, so I don't know if you'll be able to see into the printer, but basically those, those parts um, are printed today in, a, in using the, the 3D printer that um, Creates a support structure and the, the, the part within, so we just need to take them out, give them the clean up, uh, and then fit them for testing dry. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you can just see there really that we want to populate the space with people that we can really. There's brilliant ideas that are coming in all the time. Um, get people using the equipment because that's what it's there for at the end of the day. So uh, we have all this great equipment here, brilliant people coming in now, but we just want to help. Build, build on that really, get more people in, get more innovation ideas flowing. Um, brilliant linking with Anglian Water, they're very, very good with helping us on that. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can just keep on building that, myself and Chris, along with Anglian. Um, in terms of that, we have lockups in there, so we can do all sorts of different media equipment. Um, so it's not just limiting ourselves really to building we can do all sorts of things such as that as well so really whatever you can think of we will help best we can to bring, well, bring your ideas into reality really so um yes that's what we're here for so martin we uh we hope we've got the point over there it's we take a, a number of these videos and we felt that was probably the most appropriate. It's condensed. We've got a feeling for the whole area. Um, as I say, you know, there's we're looking at the business model at the moment, and we may have to uh, refine that slightly. But it's it's an ongoing process given the circumstance. So um, yeah, we're we're very keen. We're very upbeat, and uh, we look forward to it. We're actually we condense in the uh, the video slightly further this afternoon with a view of putting this on LinkedIn tonight. So any likes on that would be very well received. Okay, Chris and uh, James, thank you very much indeed. That was a, well, I think it was a fantastic run through of what is actually happening at the center. It's all very well talking about it, but when you see it in, in action with some real live uh, case studies, I, you know, I thought the one of the um, NHS sort of loo cleaning facility was just amazing to see how it can really work. And, I think the point I picked up on was when the chap said that, um, well, you know, I'd sort of been trying this in my garden shed at home, but to have everything all in one place, in one facility where I can do everything, 
uh, really makes a difference. So really, really good, uh, really good examples. Uh, so thank you very much for that. We have had a question, but I think I'll leave that until uh, until the end on your sort of business uh, processes and your business model. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, uh, gents, for, for that. Um, now, what I was going to say that it's all very well being able to use the facility and, uh, you know, we've seen examples, as I've just mentioned uh, this morning, but what about the finances uh, of your company if you're an SME? Uh, what you also have to be able to ensure is that you're in good financial condition uh, and then you can go ahead and do all your experimentation and your prototyping using the uh, fantastic facilities. So to help us with that, we have Nigel Holmes, who's the head of R&D uh, technical operations at Catax, who's going to take us through a few tricks of the financial trade, if I can call them that, to make sure that your uh, business is in good financial order for doing your uh, manufacturing and prototyping. So, uh, Nigel, over to you. Thank you, Martin. Can you hear me? We can indeed. I'll try and share my screen. Just got a few slides. Can you see the slides? We can, Nigel. Thank you very much. Excellent. Please fire away. So, yeah, so I'm Nigel Holmes, head of uh, AMD Technical Ops at Catax. Catax are a firm of tax relief specialists, and I'm going to give a very fast 10 minute whistle stop tour around a couple of tax reliefs. Very dry topic compared to having a, a tour around a, you know, a facility like that. So, I've kind of got the uh, graveyard shift here, unfortunately. But what I wanted to bear in mind when I talk is don't think about this as a dry tax relief. As uh, Martin says, it's a way to fund your r and it's a way to fund your innovation. Think of it as finance, think of it as cash, don't think of it as tax. So very briefly, who are CATAX? We're specialists in tax relief, been in existence for over 12 years. We've helped clients save over a quarter of a billion in tax in our existence. Our headquarters are in uh, Greater Manchester, and we've got offices in London, Glasgow, Channel Islands, and internationally in Vancouver. And we employ over 100 staff across all our services. So I'm going to very uh, briefly mention a couple of uh, ways to fund your innovation. But really, there's only a few routes where businesses can get cash you know, to help fund. You're either going to pay for your innovation through borrowing, so you're going to borrow money from the bank, you or uh, other lenders, you're going to uh, get money from shareholders through equity, you're going to spend uh, profits that you've retained from previous periods, and they're all kind of general uh, issues that apply to all businesses. So the, the two areas I'm going to concentrate on are the tax relief specifically for innovation being R&D tax relief and patent box. And you mustn't forget also that there are grants available to help fund innovation and CATAX offer that service as well too. So very briefly, R&D tax relief, it's a government incentive, it's not a tax loophole. A lot of people think it sounds too good to be true, but it is a tax uh, incentive in the tax legislation, vastly underclaimed by companies. Only 62,000 companies made a claim in 1718, yet it's estimated it's about 800,000 companies that could be eligible. And there's two schemes. There's a large company scheme that offers a 13 cent credit, but most companies look at the SME scheme, which is an additional 130% relief on costs. So what that means is, instead of a company just getting 100% relief on the money it spends on R&D, it gets 230%. And bear in mind that if you're loss-making, it doesn't only just apply to profitable companies. Loss-making companies can benefit from both reliefs and get money back in the form of cash rather than a tax saving. So uh, even if you're just a startup and you've never paid tax before, even if you pre revenue, it still applies to you. And if you spend money on any capital expenditure, you can have 100% relief on that as well under a different relief called research and development allowances. R&D takes many forms. It includes failed projects. It includes internal systems and procedures. So you don't have to be inventing a new product or a uh, service, it can be something internal and it can be something that hasn't worked. So all types of R&D works. So what is R&D for uh, HMRC's point of view? Well, it's, it's where a company, only applies to companies, unfortunately not sole traders or partnerships, where a company is looking to find an advance in technology or science, where there's uncertainty how to get to that advance, 
and that you have to take steps and do work to overcome that uncertainty. And when that uncertainty is not easily deducible by a competent professional in that sector. So in other words, there isn't a standard approach already available in the public domain. You know, someone hasn't done it before as far as you're aware. Now there will be trade secrets in every line of business and every industry, but as far as you are aware, what you are trying to achieve is new or unique or significantly different in your industry. This slide now shows a list of various industries where R&D can be found. It's not exhaustive. You know, what we're saying here is there is R&D in every single industry. Not every company is doing R&D. We accept that, for example, retail and wholesale. It might be just very large uh, retailers or wholesalers developing a new, very innovative software. But some categories on there, such as robotics, space, pharmaceuticals, you'd expect most companies in those sectors to be coming out R&D. But certainly there's R&D in every sector in some businesses. Well, I mentioned before, grants. Grants are a way to fund R&D. It is a common misconception that if you receive a grant towards R&D, you cannot claim the R&D tax relief as well. That is not at all true. You can have both. What it does mean is that if you've had a grant that is a state aid, you claim the R&D relief under the less generous but still worthwhile large company rate uh, because the SME scheme itself is a state aid. But that said, you still can have both and it is often overlooked. So if, you, if you've received a grant towards R&D and you've never claimed R&D tax relief, the fact that you qualify for a grant probably would say 99% of the time means you'll meet the criteria for the tax relief as well. So don't lose out, you can have both. Very brief case study here before I move on to the uh, second relief of patent box. So uh, this is a case of, case study of an engineering company based in Teesside. This company had already made an R&D tax relief claim but hadn't fully understood the definition of R&D, didn't realise it could claim for failed projects, etc. And his original claim had only benefited him to the tune of £1,541. We got involved and made an additional claim for the same period and got him an extra £27,000 back and since then we've done a couple more years of claims and found similar quantums of claims so even if you made a claim in the past doesn't mean you mean you've made a maximum claim you know worth having a second opinion to see if it's worthwhile uh, making a further claim so long as you've got uh, the two-year window still open you've got two years to make a claim then you can revise a claim that's already been made. So that was a very, very much a whistle stop to R&D tax relief. Obviously, it's far more complicated than that, and that's why we recommend you use experts like CATAX. Our fee structure and all our services is a success rate fee, so we don't charge unless we get companies' money back. So, uh, you know, there's no risk to anyone uh, just talking to us and scoping out whether it is R&D. The second relief I want to very briefly mention over just a couple of slides is patent box or patent box, pronounced either way you want. Once again, vastly underclaimed. And like R&D, tax relief deals with the costs of R&D. Patent box deals with the money generated from R&D, from the profits. So once you've done your R&D, if you then register a patent and then exploit that patent, then you can benefit from it. And what the benefit is, is an effective rate of corporation tax of only 10%. The current tax rate's 19, so you're nearly half in your tax bill if you qualify. Can be quite complicated. So once again, we recommend using a specialist. It's very analytical. It's very accounting based, and numerical based. Uh, other problems concern can be ownership. Often patents aren't in the company's name. They're either in another company's name for protection or in an individual's name that can cause issues. It's not really relevant for loss making companies because it is a, a tax saving on profits. It was phased in over a number of years, so at first it wasn't as generous as the 10% headline, but it is now fully phased in, so it is generous, and there is a complete lack of awareness. So it applies to any company that either owns a patent or has an exclusive license to exploit a patent, and it applies to companies that generate income from that patent, whether it's the sale of an item or sale of a, a product or uh, something that incorporates a patented item, license fees, Proceeds from sale of patents, compensation received from someone abusing uh, your patent, so they've, uh, you know, they've taken your patent from the public domain register and copied it, and all of those qualify for patent box. One key point to note is that 
a lot of people think that whilst patents take a long time to obtain, it's not worth uh, applying for. Patent box applies a roll-up period. So whilst you're waiting for your patent to be granted, the patent box relief is rolled up and given in the year your patent is granted. You do have to monitor the numbers from day one because you have to elect into this roll-up re regime. So you can't just wait until it's granted and look back six years and think I'll have it all. You've got to work on the numbers year in, year out, but it's still very generous that you can have the relief whilst you're waiting for the patent to be granted. So that's very much a whistle stop tour of R&D tax relief, patent box and grants. As I say, don't think of them as kind of tax reliefs. There is finance out there, there is help out there to help fund your R&D. We make around 2,000 claims per annum on R&D tax relief alone. We see very little pushback from HMRC because they're trying to encourage claims. Uh, we help identify whether your project qualifies. We wouldn't, wouldn't put in a claim if we felt it wasn't going to stand up to scrutiny in case HMRC do pick you for investigation, which is rare, but it does happen. So we want to be as robust as possible but maximize your claim. We help give advice on how to structure costs, etc. So that's me done. I'll now come back to Martin. Okay, Nigel, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, as you say, it's all about cash and cash i believe is king at the moment i know it can be many times but in these extraordinary times many of the smes that we work with and i include ourselves in sme everybody's keeping an eye on their cash flow and quite understandably so and some of those uh, opportunities you've just mentioned uh, very much relate to that and could be novel ways of bringing in more cash uh, into a company to to help the company to succeed so thank you very much um, all of the speakers you're hearing today, so earlier that we've just heard from Nigel um, just now, uh, the next speaker, John, and also Josh, um, uh, all four of those are in the four coffee rooms or breakout sessions. So just a reminder to just um, type in in the chat box which of those you wish to enter at the end of the uh, Q&A session. Uh, but thanks again to Nigel. So moving on, we're now going to hear from uh, John, uh, John Patsavalas, who's... Uh, working at Cranfield University, another one of our uh, founder members. And John, you're going to give like an overview of the opportunities in manufacturing, sort of going back out to the sort of macro level, uh, but also you'll be looking at some of the, um, a bit of guidance on some of the complexities around manufacturing in the UK and uh, how you can help with that. So uh, John, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, let me share my screen. That's good, John, we can all see that. Thank you. As Martin says, I'm, I'm John Patsavalas, I'm a senior um, lecturer in manufacturing management at Cranfield University. And Cranfield University, for those of you who may not know, is a postgraduate, a preeminent postgraduate, uh, postgraduate university in the UK uh, between uh, Bedford and Milton Keynes. And uh, we're very famous for our technology and management education. Our business school is number three in the world in economics and our manufacturing engineering department uh, feature on the top 40 of world uh, rankings. Critically, we are the UK's number one university institution for uh, research income from industry uh, per academic. So we are very, very close to practice. So as Marley said, I'm going to take a bit of a macro uh, view of uh, manufacturing in the UK. Uh, it's a uh, sector that we are very close to and we um, monitor its uh, progress and changes across time. Uh, we're still the, the ninth large manufacturing uh, country in the world. Uh, you can see the numbers jumping around a, a bit. This is says 2017, but we are still in 2020 uh, at number nine. Uh, interesting, the, uh, the movement where we see the stalwarts of manufacturing, China, United States, Japan, and Germany, South Korea, just being very stable. Um, so 11% of uh, our country's gross value added pro, uh, uh, contribution comes from the sector. And although the sector's uh, slice of the economic pie has been decreasing across uh, years, especially recent years, uh, it has, steadily increased by 1.4% per year since uh, uh, the Second World War. 
and uh, it is responsible crucially for 53% of all UK exports. Um, 2.7 million jobs, 9% of uh, the total UK employment, and crucially, and this is why it's important for us being related to this as Cranfield, 65% of the total business spend on R&D comes from companies that manufacture. And I hope they all uh, receive the R&D tax that uh, Nigel mentioned earlier on. Um, where do exports go? Uh, our exports to the United States have been growing and uh, we do export a lot in Europe. Crucially, we are the 10th biggest exporter in the world, but we're also the fourth biggest importer in the world. And certainly we are very famous for our services. We are the second country in the world for service trade. Now, when we slice the pie of the UK manufacturing sector to subsectors, here's the picture that we see today. This is up to date from uh, Make UK and the Office of National Statistics for 2019 and 2020, the food and drink uh, sector is uh, the biggest, followed by the transport sector and the rubber, plastics, and, non uh, and the, sorry, and the chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Um, very important sector, the food and drink, because uh, we've seen through COVID, we have to have some resilience in that sector, as well as in the chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Uh, we still make machinery, as you can see in this country and electrical equipment and electronics. So we still are a country of makers. Now, our sector is going through a revolution. Our German cousins have coined that as Industrie Fear, the fourth industrial revolution. And back in 2016, they estimated that in Germany alone, the digital uh, digitalization of manufacturing uh, could add cumulatively 425 billion uh, uh, euros in Germany, crucially a 30% gain on productivity. And it was in 2017, a year later, that the Made Smarter Review in the UK estimated an equivalent number for the UK manufacturing industry, 455 billion across 10 years time, and that's including the acceleration of innovation and the adoption of digital technologies. How is that going to happen? Well, by connecting machines and infrastructure with the planning and control systems in a factory environment, factories can become more efficient, um, more flexible, more responsive, and crucially, use less material and energy. Okay, well, this year, the Machines Technology Association, of which we are uh, good friends with and partner up on a lot of events, um, commissioned uh, economists to actually look at what uh, addition would decarbonizing manufacturing would make to the UK economy. And the bottom line findings are the effect on the GDP stands to be very large, some, something between 8 billion and 20 billion in output creating some 400,000 to 1 million new jobs across the economy, with 37 to 90 of those being in manufacturing and a further 34 to 83,000 in the supply chain. Someone might say, so why the big range? Well, the reason why the big range is because it involves getting a lot of things right, creating the con constructive policies that give the right regulatory framework, which act as a nudge to companies that are seeking to invest in clean products and clean technologies. Um, so, the good news is we do have already some enabling context and goals. It was only in June 2019 that the UK government um, enshrined into UK law the fact that as a country we have to achieve a 100% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, the net zero by 2050. And also, there's been an announcement in 2025 uh, that by 2025 that the fossil fuel heating systems in new houses will be history. Of course, this was uh, quite an ambitious uh, announcement, which stems from the fact that the residential sector alone accounts for 15% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is equivalent to the whole of the UK power generation emissions uh, in the country. No, not many people know that, but 
actually this brings in up a lot of challenges and opportunities for new technologies like hydrogen, electric heating and clean energy for retrofitting existing housing stock, battery electric vehicles, remanufacturing and recycling of lithium ion battery modules, still a big opportunity in Cranfield we looked at this and we haven't found yet a single company in the UK who's able or willing to recycle and remanufacture lithium ion batteries. Uh, it's a big opportunity. We know uh, that from 2040, there will be no more fossil fuel vehicles coming up. And it's only very recently that we saw our prime minister saying that um, we're going to add 10 giga, gigawatts of uh, power generation from offshore wind. We are already the biggest country of offshore wind uh, generation. And uh, I think that's a very exciting announcement, which means the whole of the supply chain is going to be incentivized to be part of that uh, growth. Two more minutes, John, please, to keep us on time. Thank sure, you. Sure. I'll speed up. Now, uh, however, not everything is what it seems in tech. Uh, something that seems like a green uh, choice may not be. Research we've done in Cranfield found out that uh, light weighting of vehicles by using aluminium in engine blocks isn't actually comparing favorably with cast iron, uh, sun casting. Uh, we've done the research. If you look at the blue line, cast iron, uh, sun casting actually uh, wins every time against all methods of aluminium production. So all is not what it seems when it comes to choices. Maturity in index uh, of digital, many levels, reaching level six, which is the autonomous self-optimizing state requires a lot of technology and a lot of digital sensors. Digital sensors have been growing. We can see the purple stack uh, graph here, uh, increasing every year. 90% of all data created in the world the last two years. Why? Because we're creating so much of it. 2.5 quintillion bytes every day. That's to 10 to the power of 18 per day. Each one of us generates 1.7 megabytes of data every second, ladies and gentlemen, which is a remarkable amount of data. And where does this all, all this data go? It goes to the cloud, which isn't in the sky, by the way. It's a data farm somewhere in the world, and they use a lot of electricity. How much electricity? Well, a lot of data. Uh, a gigabyte of data requires 2.5 kilowatt hours of electricity across a 10 year useful life. And if we were to take a projection of all the autonomous self, uh, self driving robots that will be appearing manufacturing uh, in the manufacturing sector, our optimistic scenario says that the data for the vi uh, vision systems alone that those robots will need to be able to do wayfinding and uh, positional accuracy will be about 200 million tons of CO2 across 10 years. So key considerations. What seems like green tech is not always green tech. Life cycle analysis is always needed. To make the fourth industrial revolution a green revolution, we need green tech and green data. There is a gap in the UK market for information technology and operation technology integrators. And I don't have enough time to explain that, but uh, feel free to ask me in the breakouts what that means for opportunities. And to maximize, to get close to that half a trillion pound opportunity, we believe that a systems approach coordinated across many sectors is essential. We should be talking about green as well as digital skills. And we are waiting with better breath uh, for that 100 billion uh, pound package for the UK clean energy and infrastructure growth. Cranfield offers many ways for industry to get uh, 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 partnered up with us from a light touch to the uh, education element to bespoke uh, courses to funded opportunities. And um, that takes care of both problem solving uh, requirements and upskilling. In the center where I'm at, we're helping people to grow green in a green, lean and smart way, developing new manufacturing systems, efficient factories, uh, getting to net zero, new materials choices, integration of digital and green, 
and obviously operational leadership for operations excellence. We are running an event in the first week of December. You're all very welcome to join. It's all about the green recovery. You can join here and that's my contact details. Thank you very much. John, thank you. Thank you very much for that crikey with all of that experience and expertise. I think you could keep us occupied um, all day. And uh, I've certainly learned a new word, quintillion. Indeed. I'm sure I've heard that before. It does sound like an awful lot. Uh, but thank you very much indeed for all of that. Uh, let's keep moving. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Josh uh, Simpson, who's from STEC. He's just going to finish off in terms of our presentations this morning and remind everybody about the importance of uh, asset management and asset protection in terms of your business when you're uh, working in manufacturing. Josh, over to you. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, that's great. And it's probably the perfect time for me to come in, having uh, uh, listened to the interesting talks from Nigel and John about the opportunities um, that, that come with uh, being part of Cambridge Clean Tech. And we're a founding member. Um, we're actually uh, part of the Alan Boswell Group. We've got an office in Peterborough. Um, our head office is in Norwich, and uh, I'm actually based in Cambridge. Uh, we've recently just partnered up with Peterborough United, and uh, we, we're kind of looking at exploring certainly the, the Peterborough area. And, and this is a great opportunity um, to kind of uh, let you all know the the uh, offers that we can provide to, to kind of make sure that any sets that you have or any ideas that you have, um, any funding that you might receive can be protected um, through a well thought out insurance proposal. Um, it is, um, of course, insurance can be number 10 or 11 on the ladder of things to think about, but of course, it can become the most important tool if something does happen, um, whether that's at a premises or whether that's to, to one of your employees. So I'm just looking at trying to briefly, again, run through today um, uh, the points that need to be taken into consideration uh, for any kind of manufacturing company. Um, we actually do uh, specialise in life science and technology at STEC, and um, we provide insurance cover for startups all the way up to multinational uh, companies. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about certainly would be um, kind of the, the statutory requirements um, that, that, that you have as an employer. Um, and that certainly starts with your employees. So as soon as a startup company or any commercialised company um, does start to employ um, people, um, there is a legal requirement to have employers liability insurance in place. And particularly within the manufacturing sector, I see that as a very, very important um, cover. Um, of course, so I won't go too in, into too many kind of grisly details, but we have seen some pretty pretty bad claims with um, em, em, employees and employers' liability insurance coming in and, and, and covering any kind of um, accidents that may happen. Um, and, and it's an important, important cover to have. But of course, the main reason is that that is a statutory requirement and you can be um, fined fine by the HSC quite, quite severely if you haven't got that cover in place. Um, the second kind of statutory requirement for, for any kind of manufacturing company certainly would be engineering inspection of any items um, that, that may require legally to be inspected either every six months, 12 months, sometimes 24 months. Um, and, and I've just listed out there the actual um, statutory regulations that, that do um, state um, when you will need to have um, an engineering inspection policy in place. And that just involves a, a, a specialist um, engineer inspector come out and just test the equipment to make sure that they're safe to be to be used for on a day to day basis. Again, if these um, items aren't inspected um, on the basis that they need to be, there can be some hefty fines um, and actually a company can be closed down until the inspections have taken place and the HSC are satisfied. Um, that the cover um, and the checks uh, have been made. Uh, again, we have seen some incidents where they've been companies being very, very lucky in that uh, an item may not have been checked in the in the right amount of time, and there has been um, items that have um, essentially had near misses and, and uh, in regards to employees using them. So it's uh, again that is a statutory requirement. So in terms of a, a manufacturing company. Those two items there um, on your screen are, are, are what you have to do by law. Looking then towards some covers that are essential but, but not legally required um, would be the public and, and certainly the products liability insurance for a manufacturing company. Quite simply, the public liability insurance covers damage um, to third party persons, for example, should they visit the company premises. 
as well as damage caused when visiting um, somebody else's premises. Um, but currently, quite often this is the case, especially for, for startup companies, this will cover um, any kind of damage um, that may be caused to a premises where you're renting the premises, for example. Um, let's say that uh, a, a piece of kit um, catches fire, causes damage to, to a large amount of the, of the third party property, you're going to need insurance cover and an insurance company to, to pay out and, and basically put that um, uh, property back to where it should have been had the incident not happened. Um, again, another crucial part of, of the insurance um, policy will be your product liability insurance. Um, many of you guys will be um, manufacturing and creating products. And if these products are to be sold, could go anywhere around the world. And if they cause damage to, to property or, or to third party, uh, third parties through property or, or through people, then of course you, you will be held potentially liable um, for that. And um, uh, as such, a, a product's liability insurance section has to be in place for you um, to ensure that any damage caused is, is picked up by an insurer. I think a, a very key aspects, especially with companies who are receiving funding and um, potentially getting uh, big pieces of kit. Um, see, we saw a CNC machine earlier, we, we provide lots of cover for, for that type of equipment. Of course, this, this is all um, potentially funding that's been, that's been given to you and you've bought these pieces of kit. Now, if, if, if for example, there was a, a total loss, such would, um, overnight there was a fire at the premises, you, you realistically are going to be liable for a million pound piece of kit that maybe someone's provided funding for. Now, the best way to protect that is by an insurance policy, um, and that would be um, for machinery and plant, any kind of, as I say, specialist equipment, even things as simple as computers and fixtures and fittings. Um, the last thing you want to, to have is, is all your hard work and, and funding um, that's been given to you, taken, taken away cruelly overnight potentially, and not have any way of replacing those items to continue your good work. Um, again, this is, this is something that we would provide cover for for every single manufacturing company. Um, and you need to take into account items that may be specialists that come from abroad that might have lead times of a month or two months. Um, so again, providing cover for the items that you may be excited that you've received from the funding, but of course, if something happened to these items, what happens to, to the funding? I'm sure they'll be coming, potentially knocking at your door and asking uh, for your insurance policy to, to put things right. So asset covers there your buildings cover, your tenants improvements cover, if you do make changes to a premises that, that, that might need um, specialist equipment um, placed in. Again, Alia, I've uh, just seen um, the, the tool there. There's some really nice pieces of, of equipment there and, and insurance policy will be in place to make sure that anything happens, uh, anything that happens there um, will, will be replaced accordingly. Of course, another area um, that maybe isn't quite mentioned as much is, is a risk management element to a manufacturing um, site. Uh, reducing it or eliminating risk is only going to uh, have a positive impact on the company um, and will potentially reduce your insurance premiums. Um, at the Alan Boswell Group, we actually offer an in-house health and safety risk management service, um, and that can be useful um, for uh, six months. Uh, a six month visit, a 12 month visit um, to ensure that you are aware of your statutory requirements to, to ensure that you're aware of um, any kind of uh, policies in regards to keeping items safe, in, in regards to employees, um, PPE equipment, for example. It's important to know where you need to um, potentially uh, eliminate risks to ensure that, of course, your, your um, funding and, and your uh, items that you've received through your funding it is is going to have um, uh, there's going to be no uh, chance of damage to those items or minimal chance of damage um, to ensure again that you can continue doing what you're doing and uh, have that peace of mind of of if anything does go wrong we're here on the other end of the phone to come out and see you guys and make sure that that we put things right. There are some hidden risks that do tend to um, come about as a company commercialises for example, a business interruption. I'm sure that you've all heard recently about COVID-19 and business interruption and insurers, but I won't be talking about that <laughs> quite today. But certainly for, for manufacturing companies, in the event of a total loss, again, if there was a fire overnight, a business interruption section of cover um, essentially puts the company back to where they would have been had that, um, had that loss not 
occurred. As, as I'm sure you can appreciate, that's a, a huge and important um, element of cover um, because the last thing you want to do is have all your hard work undone um, only to have to build up from the ground again without any financial support potentially. Um, an insurer will, will continue to pay the monthly cost that you need to pay um, regardless of whether there's an incident or not, whether that is wage roll, for example, whether that is um, bills that, that are unavoidable. Um, and of course, your, your, your gross profit, your profit that you are starting to make as you're, as you're commercialising. Um, so that is an important part of the business interruption process. Of course, there are supply chain risks. You've got suppliers and customers that might be absolutely key to your uh, carrying on as a, as a business. Um, what, was that, what would be to happen if, if your key supplier had a fire overnight and you had no option to, to replace them? An insurance policy can help with that until you can find a new supplier. Again, a key customer, you might only sell to one, one customer. If, if they were to go under overnight, we can help with that and we can ensure that the business continues if there is any kind of interruption um, interruption there. Um, another uh, key factor that maybe is hidden is environmental um, liability. Um, if there was uh, cleanup costs required through leaks of harmful substances, if there was um, any kind of uh, gradual or kind of unforeseen um, pollution that may occur that, that you had no idea about, you are still liable for the cleanup costs and can incur fines if, if those costs do end up on a, on a neighbouring land, for example. Um, an environmental impairment liability policy may be required for you guys who um, use, use substances that if they were leaked would be harmful. So again, that's another, another string, if you like, to the bow of, of, the, of the risk management that we can help with, um, as well as credit insurance. Again, in this very, very turbulent time, there are many, many companies going under um, and a lot of these companies may um, be key to you. If they do go under, will you be able to survive? That's where a credit insurance policy comes in. It pays that, that credit that you are owed from a company who may well um, have, have gone under and, and have debts that are unrecoverable. Um, so again, as, as, as kind of Nigel and John says, there is a, a, a load of more information and, and, and of course, uh, uh, every business is unique, so the risks will be unique. But this kind of gives an overview of of a company's um, statutory requirements, um, the almost certain um, risks that you need to cover, and of course some potential hidden risks that, that, that might be there. Um, but the key is, as always, um, to, to pick up the phone and to, to email us and we can come out to see you and, and physically see the risks, you know, if that, if that is possible during this time, um, then, then we, we're always happy to help. So um, be more than happy to answer any questions, of course, or, or speak to you um, in, the, in the breakout room. So. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Martin. That's um, that's it for me. Okay, Josh. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I don't know. With insurance, it can be um, quite interesting. Uh, you might think, well, I'll save a few quid. I'll just go to Direct Line or Insurance R Us or whatever they may be called. Uh, but all I can say is that um, we have been using Estec since we started ten years ago, and a it saves a lot of time, so you don't save any money going onto the web anyway. And B, where we did have an issue, unfortunately, um, just after we started, sort of seven or eight years ago, with a misdemeanor from a member of staff. I won't go into any detail, and member of staff's no longer with us. Uh, we were fully covered, uh, thankfully, due to the comprehensive work that uh, Josh and his team had, uh, had done for us. So thank you very much for that, Josh. Just a bit of personal insight from me as well. Um, and just to say now, we'll go straight into the Q&A. Um, and I can see a hand up already. So there's... Um, Ola, um, do you want to ask a question? I've, I've got one written down as well, but Ola, do you want to go first? Did you have a hand up or was that my, um, maybe it was my own uh, screen pointer. I might have mistaken that. So if that was the case, apologies for that. I'm going to go to uh, David Alexandra, who is asking of the Alia team at, uh, at Peterborough. Um, how do SMEs access the facilities and also what is the fee? Is it a, is it a membership fee? Um, is it something else? And can you just go and pay for one piece of kit or do you have to pay for everything? How much flexibility is there? I think that's a question for, uh, for James and for Chris. Um, yeah, I'm probably best equipped to take that one. Um, so yeah, we, at the moment we are running a membership team. So typically we would bring um, SMEs and entrepreneurs in for a hundred pound a month. And with that, what they would get is access to the equipment. 
um, we would assume that certain people, certain entrepreneurs would want to use certain types of equipment. And what happens then, uh, Nigel, is that they would do an induction um, under the watchful eye of James and just make sure they were equipped to use that equipment in his absence, for instance. They would typically come in three days a week. Um, they would get a, a pass to the lab itself we don't work weekends, but um, what, the one thing I would say there, the caveat is because going back to my earlier comments, we're looking to try and run this till the end of the year. And then from year end, hopefully if the dust is settling, et cetera, we can probably put a better plan together, a longer term, et cetera. But as it stands at the moment, we're looking memberships for a hundred pound a month. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying that, Chris. Um, I do believe also that um, attendees um, at today's event will also be offered a free uh, initial session uh, to use the uh, facility at our earlier. So if anybody wishes to do that, please just let us know and we can uh, organize that for you through, uh, through James and through Chris. And also, of course, by the way, uh, the other speakers are all offering a free initial consultation as well, if you wish to use um, any of their services. So just whilst we're waiting for any more questions, um, I just wanted to mention as well that we've, what we've decided to do is reduce down to two coffee rooms at the end. So room one uh, will be Cranfield and Arlia and room two will be Catax and Estec. So do nominate which room you wish to go into. I can see from the chat box uh, that some people have been doing that um, already. Uh, so further questions from the audience, please. Any more uh, questions people want to ask of any of the speakers this morning? We've had a an overall round of manufacturing um, across the UK, some very interesting uh, items of information from John. And then we've had more detail, the tour of the Innovation Lab itself, which was fascinating with those case studies. And then a bit of backup support as well from a uh, you know claiming tax relief point of view and also from uh, asset protection in terms of insurance. So a good round up all round, but uh, any pressing questions from anybody in the audience? It looks as if the speakers have uh, stunned everybody into uh, into silence. Um, and can I just check then with the earlier team? I presume you've have you know you've got people in there today that you've been showing around. You're fully open for business. I mean, this is a sort of a an informal launch today, as such. But you're open, running, and contact you if people are interested. Is that right, uh, Chris? Oh uh, yeah, very much. Uh, we are gathering traction there, there was probably a month ago when um, we, we seem to get a number of members on board etc but then there's been a slight hiatus again with announcements and we're just we're bending in the wind at the moment Martin and that's why I'm saying you know in terms of any terms we'd like to run this till the end of the year and then hopefully from next year we get a better position and say we can extend the terms we can negotiate memberships etc as i said you know potentially a bit of product development and concept evaluation so we're we're still evolving i suppose that's uh, reasonable to say but we're all geared up we're ready to take any members on now and uh so anyone from entrepreneurs to the smes the smaller companies through to the larger corporates because the opportunities there are collaborations with the likes of anglian water etc so we're we're pretty equipped you know it's uh Hopefully we get extremely busy and we, we've got to redefine the business model in the new year. So, uh, but yeah, we, first and foremost, we're looking to get a few more members in. Yeah. Okay. That's great, Chris. Sounds like plenty of uh, flexibility there. Um, I will just touch on something else actually, because um, Josh, I think you mentioned that you're working with uh, Peterborough United. Uh, now as a Preston North End fan, I, I could be flippant and say, well, somebody has to, uh, but on a serious point, I'm just going to mention to David that of course, um, the earlier business centre at Peterborough is built into one of the stands at Peterborough United. So maybe a, a chance for you there, just have a chat uh, with each other about that and your links to the uh, to the football club. And also just to mention that STEC are offering uh, a 10% discount to Cleantech, uh, Cambridge Cleantech members who take up um, the option to, to work with STEC and to provide insurance for the, uh, for the member company. Um, but it doesn't look like we're getting any more questions as such. So... I'm just going to ask Oriana or Cynthia just to uh, mention to everybody now what you do now to go into the two breakout rooms, if one of you wants to tell us what that is. 
Uh, just a reminder that uh, room one is uh, Alia and Cranfield and room two is Katax and Estec. Uh, 